uh, we I think we should move on to the right to move on to the next paper and then we'll take a break after the next one. So um, Augusta uh, and Ernst are both here. So I suggest we just go to the next paper. So the next paper is going to be presented by Augustin Landy from HEC Paris and the title is ESG investing, how to optimize impact. Great, thank you. Can you, can you guys uh, hear me and see the slides? Yes. Yes, perfect. Okay, so let me start. So this is joined with uh, Stefano Lobo, uh, colleague from uh, HEC. So the motivation, just to put a bit of uh, perspective, so I think we all agree, you know, that negative externalities by uh, corporations is a big, uh, big uh, uh, theme on the agenda. Um, so far, the, the traditional economic prescription has been to use Pigouvian taxes or, you know, pollution permits, cap and trade, basically. But the results have been somewhat disappointing, probably because of political economy reasons, you know, free riding among countries, political short termism, after all, uh, politicians have to be reelected, uh, lobbying frictions, etc. And actually, in France, you know, the, the yellow jacket uh, movement was actually started by uh, uh, the, the, the decision of the government to raise taxes on, on gasoline. So basically, you know, like that's what legitimates, in a sense, uh, looking at whether the financing channel can, you know, be a way to, uh, to have firms uh, internalizing externalities. Well, there is a big rise of ESG finance. I'm not going to, uh, to insist on, on that here, but I will insist instead of what is difficult to actually um, make sure that ESG investing does actually have an impact on the behavior of companies. And I think there, there are two main constraints that need to be addressed. The first one is to have competitive returns, you know, meaning that, of course, if you are willing to accept very low returns, you can have an impact by subsidizing companies to change uh, what they do. But the question is, you know, like assuming that people are not willing to give up a lot on returns, is it still possible to have an impact on uh, uh, the behavior of companies? And the second difficulty, uh, and it's actually related to the first one, is capital substituability. So if ESG funds coordinate to ban some companies from their portfolio, uh, bah, those companies can actually decide to, uh, to go elsewhere and try to uh, uh, basically uh, just you know, uh, raise capital from agnostic investors, if you want. And so that channel can be very powerful and pretty much undo what ESG funds are trying to do. And actually, so among practitioners, this trade-off, so it's quite interesting, it's not always recognized, right? Many uh, ESG funds are still under a kind of win-win doctrine where they say, look, we can actually do better by, uh, by behaving well, by banning the vicious companies from the portfolio. Uh, and usually, you know, the, the assumption they make is that there is some kind of underreaction of the market to these themes. And so they make a bet in a sense that regulations will tighten and therefore, uh, nicer companies are going to, uh, to be the winners of tomorrow and that the market is not aware of that. So it's kind of, kind of you know, like heavy um, assumptions, basically. Uh, and uh, it can definitely not be, I mean, maybe it's true temporarily, but it cannot be a foundation, a doctrine for ESG investing, because at some point, so that kind of underreaction is going to flip back, you know, and the cost of capital of dirty companies might go up, which means that actually the returns of these companies might, might be higher. And if you, you guys teach this, so there is an interview by Bill Gates where he basically phrases very well uh, in very clear language this, this view that the substitution effect might be very big. He says, divestment to date probably has reduced about zero tons of emissions. It's not like you have capital starved, the people making steel and gasoline. I don't know the mechanism of action they hope for. And so the, the goal of the paper is to try to uh, to try to think about whether there is a scope for impact without giving up uh, much on, on the returns side. So there are many, I mean, we are part of a big literature. Let me just mention uh, Heinkel, Heinkel Krauss Zeschner, who were probably the, the first paper to model, you know, that channel whereby um, investors can have an impact on companies through their cost of capital. Uh, and I will also um, mention the, the paper uh, by Martin and Marcus, um, we, which is here, 
uh, with whom we share basically, I think the, the same uh, feeling that there is a lack of doctrine for, you know, how does ESG have impact? And they look at it from a, um, a different angle from us, but with some, uh, some common um, conclusions actually that show that a lot of what is seen as very natural in the ESG world might not be natural at all once you try to look for, uh, for principles for it. So let me give you a little bit of a preview of, um, of the results. So the first part of the, the paper is, is an irrelevant result, namely that you know, if there is no financial frictions, an ESG fund that has to produce competitive returns will have no impact. That's in a limit case where uh, investors are not willing to give up on returns. Um, industry tilts uh, alone by themselves has no impact. So just boycotting some industry or saying, I don't invest in coal will not change. Um, basically, you know, how much this sector pollutes. Uh, the environmental footprint of a fund portfolio is not a good measure of its impact. And then impact requires that defining sensible pollution limits, sensible in that it is actually rational for companies to comply with those uh, limits and committing to financing only the firms that are compliant with those limits. Uh, and then the last uh, one is about the supply chain. So I will show uh, in a way that I think is quite natural that you can actually amplify your impact uh, quite a lot by putting restrictions on the kind of suppliers that uh, your, uh, the companies where you invest are using. And so basically this indirect channel is going to be an amplifier for uh, the impact that you can have as an investor. So I will first show you um, the baseline model with direct incentives, meaning that you only, as an ESG investor, only put constraints on what the companies where you invest uh, do. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Sorry. Hello, hello. OK, let me, um, let me continue. So in the, then I will show, speak about indirect incentives, uh, where uh, basically I will um, explore this amplification for the supply chain, and then uh, I will wrap up with uh, practical implications. OK, so it's a general equilibrium model uh, with uh, an economy with uh, two sectors. So you have two goods. They are both used for consumption and production. So the, the reason I need that is because I want to, to have this input-output metrics right, for uh, modeling the supply chain. So we have a mass one of atomistic entrepreneurs. They have an ability to run a firm, only one firm, and they have no initial wealth. So they will need to go to the capital market to find wealth. So conditional on them finding one unit of capital, their production function is the following. It's a function of the pollution they emit, EI, and the intermediary goods from the other sector that they um, use as an input, XIJ. Okay, and so basically I use a Cobb Douglas uh, function here uh, just for the purpose of having close form solutions, but basically well, the functional form does not matter uh, uh, very much here, except uh, that we need concavity for the, um, the equilibrium to, uh, to exist. So the level of pollution, I'm going to assume it's between zero and one. So the maximum pollution that's, you know, if you just don't care about pollution, then you pick the technology that, you know, is the most efficient and uh, uh, your level of pollution will be one. And so the question is, okay, if I want to curb my pollution, I need to give up a bit on efficiency and I will have an output that is uh, a bit smaller. Okay, now let's turn to the capital uh, side. So we have a mass one of atomistic capitalists. Uh, they are each endowed with one unit of capital and they are going to delegate their portfolio choice to competitive intermediaries that compete to basically uh, attract their capital. So there will be regular funds that just maximize returns and there will be an ESG fund which is willing to on top of that maximize social welfare and I, I will um, specify very precisely what, what I mean by that in a minute. So to make that clear, so what are the preferences of individuals? So the type of utility functions we have in mind are uh, consequentialist in the sense that we assume that investors care about impact and impact is basically a measure of welfare uh, when they invest uh, and welfare when they don't invest. So it's really basically like they attribute to uh, their, uh, their actions a fraction of what the ESG fund is able to achieve 
as a change between uh, welfare in equilibrium versus welfare in a laissez-faire economy with no ESG fund. Okay, so I will, I will have to compute basically this impact by uh, the ESG fund and uh, each investor basically attributes to herself a fraction of that impact that is proportional to the capital that it has contributed to the um, ESG fund. And this parameter mu, but if it's equal to zero, then we are back to uh, standard uh, selfish preferences. So they are standard except for the denominator here, I introduce uh, a disutility from aggregate pollution. So big EI is the sum of all the small EIs, uh, namely the pollution of each individual firm in sector I. Okay, and so I distinguish E1 and E2. So these are the two sectors. So you could add them up if you want, but here it allows for them to be different types of pollution. It could be radioactivity on the nuclear sector, for example, and uh, carbon emissions on the, on the coal uh, industry sector. Okay. So in the talk, so to simplify things, I'm going to, to consider a corner case, uh, a limit case where I will assume that mu goes to zero. So think about it as lexicographic preferences, meaning that people, you know, are, they, they really want to maximize their returns and conditional on having the same returns, uh, uh, they are looking for, you know, I mean, they, they are inclined uh, to give their money uh, to a fund that has more impact. Okay, so that's going to be a limit case and uh, uh, I will take the, the share, I mean, the amount, total amount of capital that will be collected by the ESG fund as exogenous. So that's going to simplify the, uh, the exposition. And also it's a way to show that even in that limit case, actually the ESG fund can have uh, an impact. Okay, so here is the timing. So first, uh, each capitalist chooses whether they invest with the ESG fund or the non-ESG fund. Then the, the, the ESG fund is going to announce first the weights it is going to allocate in each industry. And second, the emission limits it is imposing for a company to be eligible to its capital. So basically it says, look, I'm not going to lend money to entrepreneurs who are polluting more than E1 hat in industry one and E2 hat in industry two. It will turn out to be optimal and that's quite obvious to have different pollution limits in different industries. Okay, so then entrepreneurs choose in what industry they want to start a company and they choose the technology of their firm. So an assumption here is that actually that choice is uh, irreversible. Then uh, uh, capital and entrepreneurs are matched on a market that will have a matching friction that I will describe in a sec. And then production occurs, profits are shared between entrepreneurs and capitalists. And now, you know, like both types, they just become, you know, households who consume goods, uh, basically facing the same prices in the same market. So let me speak about, uh, speak about the, the matching friction. So I'm going to assume that if you comply with what the ESG fund wants, so because, you know, there is a mass one of capitalists and a mass one of entrepreneurs, then you will get financing with probability one because everybody is basically uh, willing to finance you. Now, if you don't comply uh, with the restrictions that the ESG fund is imposing, then you take the risk that it's going to take time for you to find, uh, to find capital. And so the way we model that is that we assume that you will get financed only with a probability that is smaller than one, and that is uh, proportional to one minus SI, where SI is the fraction of capital in the pool of capital dedicated to industry I, which is ESG, divided by one minus eta I times SI. And eta I is a measure of the matching efficiency in sector I. So if, if the market is perfect, eta I is equal to one, it means that, you know, even if you don't comply, you will end up finding uh, capital. If eta is equal to zero, then it means you find capital with probability one minus SI when you don't comply, which means that basically you have only one draw from the pool of capital, okay? And then if you get unlucky and you find an, a capitalist that is not willing to, uh, uh, to finance you because your production function is too dirty, then uh, you just, uh, you have no second chance. Okay, so eta is a way to index basically to have a range between this uh, perfect efficiency versus uh, uh, only one chance uh, cases. Okay, 
So now what is an equilibrium? So an equilibrium, it's a system of prices for the goods, a vector of uh, prices and a vector of fund returns. Uh, so returns, if I invest in a non-ESG fund dedicated to industry one, a non-ESG fund dedicated to industry two, or the ESG fund and in equilibrium, if the ESG fund is not, doesn't have zero capital, then these three returns have to be uh, equal. So all individuals maximize their utility, they take prices as given, that's why there is an externality. I mean, they don't internalize uh, the, their, their impact. Um, markets have to clear. And I assume the ESG fund conditional on, on its amount of capital is going to rationally, you know, like choose its policy such as to maximize impact on social welfare. And so the goal of the paper is to basically like figure out, you know, what's the optimal allocation and the optimal uh, caps that you can impose on the companies and what does it depend on. So here, well, given we have, uh, we have assumed Cobb Douglas functions, actually well, it helps a lot. I think it, it doesn't change the, 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 the fundamental forces, but it helps a lot characterizing the equilibrium for a reason that here, basically the amount of ESG capital is not going to change the relative size of industries. Uh, that relative size is going to depend purely on exogenous parameters. And so in equilibrium, uh, if the ESG fund uh, does exist, uh, all the funds and all the industries will provide the same return on capital that only depends uh, on exogenous parameters. And social welfare, I will be able to compute social welfare just by, if you tell me, you know, what is the equilibrium amount of pollution of industry one and industry two, uh, then I will be able to directly compute social welfare. So that's going to facilitate a lot the computation of the equilibrium. So let me just describe less faire So imagine there is no ESG fund that cares about externalities. So here, basically, everybody is going to pollute their maximum level. So E1 will be equal to E2 will be equal to one. And the utility will therefore be one where you know, there is a lot of aggregate pollution uh, in the atmosphere. Now, what is the first best? The first best can be computing just by optimizing this function I've shown you here. And so if you do that, you end up with an EI star that trade-offs between the efficiency of polluting in a given industry, and that depends on beta, versus how much pollution from that industry is harmful um, in the utility of people. And that's the delta uh, term that is, uh, that is here. It also depends on whether it's an industry that is useful as an input for other industries, right? So the more that industry is useful, the more costly it is to put harsh restrictions on that industry, even in the first best. Okay, so now let's think about the choice by the entrepreneur of the level of pollution he chooses for the, the technology of its company, of her company. So if the entrepreneur decides to comply with the requirement of the ESG fund, then its level of production is going to be E to the exponent beta. And so basically it's clear that for a given limit that is imposed to her, but the entrepreneur is going to choose that threshold itself, right? Because the, that's the maximum it can pollute and therefore the more money it can make while being compliant. Now, if you choose to not comply, so to have a level of pollution above the threshold imposed by uh, the ESG capitalists, then you, know, you are not doomed to, um, to not produce, but you will produce only with a probability that is smaller than one, which is here. Uh, but you will produce more, and so actually this term should be uh, the, should be one here, meaning that you know you are going to. Uh, no, sorry, it's not one, so it's EI exponent beta, and uh, you see that you will actually choose EI equal to one because there is no reason, there is nothing that actually makes it attractive to uh, to not choose maximum pollution. Okay, and so with that in mind, basically that gives us a first constraint, which is the highest threshold that the ESG capitalist can impose on an industry uh, while uh, you know, making sure that entrepreneurs are actually going to comply with that threshold. So they will comply if basically entrepreneurs in sector I are indifferent between complying, which is what they get on the right-hand side, versus not complying, uh, 
which is what they get on the left hand side and we are basically you know like finding capital is a bit more um, difficult for them okay so now we can solve for the optimal problem of the ESG fund. So they maximize aggregate utility in this economy. Uh, what they have to choose is the threshold that they impose to companies under two constraints. One is the compliance constraint, which says that these limits have to be reasonable enough that entrepreneurs actually want to comply with them. Uh, and uh, their portfolio constraint, which states that, you know, the sum of the capital they invest in industry one and industry two, it has to add up with S, which is the amount they collected uh, ex ante. Okay, so a first result is a specialization result, which says that, you know, in this setup, uh, unless the ESG fund is, is really large, uh, it should fix its battles and specialize in one sector so that it's going to be a big fish in that sector and really curb emissions in that sector. So for a small fund, uh, I mean, if the, the, the aggregate ESG capital is small, it could, should coordinate its battles on one uh, industry. Then there is a medium range uh, where the ESG pool of capital is big enough that actually it should try to be present in several sectors. Um, and then there is a range uh, that is actually like strictly, you know, like S strictly smaller than one, where actually ESG investors are able to implement the first best, uh, even though they don't have 100% of the capital in the, uh, in the economy. Let me try to describe graphically what happens in this economy. So you have three zones here. The first zone, which corresponds to a small ESG fund. So on the horizontal axis, you have S, the total amount of capital managed by uh, the ESG fund. If that amount of capital is small enough, that you see that in green, you have the level of emissions that are going to be uh, imposed and uh, implemented by the ESG fund. And so you see that it's going to focus the ESG fund on curbing emissions in only one sector. In that example, it's sector two, but it leaves the emissions in sector one unchanged. And actually, they you know saturate the, the constraint of uh, being equal to one, which is the maximum level of emissions that is allowed. Okay, so then we enter a zone where the ESG fund is going to actually curb the emissions in both sectors and invest in uh, in both. And then you have a third zone where we have a plateau of you know like the the welfare improvement that the ESG fund is inducing and actually um, basically the, the emission thresholds do not change anymore and we achieve the first best. So U in blue is the um, aggregate welfare. You see that it is uh, kind of obviously uh, increasing with the ESG fund and it is strictly monotonic up to a threshold where basically we achieve first best. We cannot do better than that. Um, and then, so what's interesting is that it's an economy where ESG investors are going to improve welfare by reducing uh, the GDP. Uh, so aggregate consumption goes down and actually in both sectors, it goes down. So even when ESG um, investors do not try to impose restrictions on sector one, you see that the consumption of good one goes down simply because people are poorer, right? So. Uh, the, the constraints imposed on sector two are going to also have an impact on the aggregate output of sector one. So that's what happens in equilibrium. And one nice uh, outcome of this specification is uh, a rule to tell you in what sectors you want to specialize as the ESG fund. How do you pick the sector where you should focus and intervene if we focus on the, on the case of a small ESG fund? So basically there are three effects to take into account. So the first one is you want to pick a sector where actually there is a big gain uh, in economic efficiency from reducing pollution. And that's going to be determined by the gap between laissez-faire level of emission, which is one versus the first best level of emission, which is E star. Okay, so that can depend both on the toxicity of the pollution in that sector and on how much it is needed in the production process. And the second term, which is the interesting one, which really makes the ESG fund different from a central planner, is how much grip it has on the entrepreneur. 
And that grip, it can be decomposed in two effects. So one is exogenous, it's the size of the financial friction that is assumed in that sector. So that's captured by eta. And the second one is the size of the sector. And here the idea is, you know, as a fund, you can decide to focus on a small sector so that you become a big fish in a small pound. And, you know, like entrepreneurs in that small sector are actually not going to ignore you. They are going to acknowledge that, you know, you put restrictions. They will listen basically to the, to the constraints that you put because ignoring them will be for them uh, basically uh, uh, not having access to a large fraction of the pool of capital, which is costly for them, example. Okay, so these are the three ingredients that are you know, important to, in a sense, choose how to pick your battles. Now let me, uh, in the five minutes, okay. So let me say a few words on indirect emissions and then I will, uh, I will wrap up. So, so far I've just focused on the restrictions that the fund is putting on the emissions that the firm itself is, uh, is doing. Uh, but we can also put restrictions potentially on emissions of customers and emissions of suppliers. So let me focus on emission of suppliers. Actually, emission of customers, it's uh, even more powerful, but too much in a sense. Uh, in the model, you can actually like have a, a massive impact. Uh, so let me focus on the supplier. So imagine that, okay, now I can put restrictions on the list of suppliers that you have to use if you uh, want to have access to uh, the ESG fund capital. And so the question we ask is, but can it be optimal for the ESG fund to impose both direct and indirect uh, incentives? So what happens, it's interesting, it, it creates an endogenous split of one sector between a clean subsegment of that sector and a dirty subsegment of that sector. So you end up, so I will take the example where that happens to sector one. So sector one here is going to become endogenous split between companies that choose to be clean, companies that choose to remain dirty and regular funds are going to, um, to provide capital to both clean and dirty companies. Uh, the ESG fund is going to uh, finance purely sector two actually and curb sector one indirectly through constraints on what sector two uh, can, uh, can use uh, as suppliers. And then the consumers here, I assume they don't care, they basically use uh, the cheapest goods they can. And so in equilibrium, it's actually going to be the dirty good, the dirty good, because it's actually uh, uh, more cheap to produce is going to be uh, uh, the cheapest one in equilibrium always. And so the characterization of the equilibrium, it's pretty much the same, except that we have one new parameter, which is the price of the dirty good. Uh, and so we need one additional equation. And that additional equation is the, this one, the second one. It tells us that in the sector that is split in two, um, entrepreneurs have to be indifferent between producing the dirty good or producing the clean good. In both cases, uh, they are not going to uh, get ESG uh, capital. They are going to be financed by uh, agnostic, uh, uh, agnostic investors. And so just to give you um, um, well, the particular case of what we show, if we again focus on a small ESG fund uh, that is a bit uh, you know, like infinitesimal vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the aggregate capital market, then uh, we characterize what it should do. So it should in the case of uh, its possible access to indirect uh, uh, restrictions, it could invest. It should invest all its capital in the industry that has the highest capital market friction, and then it should put an emission cap only on the emissions of the priority sector, namely the one where it is the most efficient economically to uh, reduce um, emissions. And that cap is going to be direct if it turns out that that sector coincides with the sector with the highest friction, or it will be an indirect emission uh, if it's the other sector. So let me stop there. Uh, and I will uh, basically, uh, I think my time is over, uh, isn't it? Uh, I... uh, you have one and a half more minutes, but- uh... Okay, <laughs> up, uh, up to you. I mean, I can wrap up very quickly. Choose so wisely, I don't know. <laughs> we can yeah, take yeah. a couple of questions or have a... 
All right, so then let's uh, yeah, go to the discussant. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much, Augustin. Thank you. Thank uh, you. The discussant is uh, Ernst Mauck from the University of Mannheim Business School. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the organizers for letting me dis uh, discuss this really interesting uh, paper. So uh, uh, I would uh, first like to say this is a really great paper. Now, this is these days a bland statement because all discussions, discussions say that, but I think I really like that this is a simple model. Everything can be uh, uh, solved in closed form. It's a clean analysis, and I think it makes a number of really important points. So I could stop there, but um, I really have kind of a, a, a difficult personal take on this paper. I really love the paper, but I don't love the spin. Um, so I have a very different uh, kind of takeaway from this paper than, than I think what the authors have. So I think I, I think the, the authors can keep all of the inter, uh, all of the uh, main analysis of the paper, but I want them to rewrite the, the title, the introduction, and the conclusion. Uh, so uh, let's go back. Uh, what is the question we're asking? The, the question that is asked in this paper is a really important question, and that is, what if the market fails? Then we want to find an effective mechanism to address the externalities uh, in production. So. How do we typically think about it? We, we think about the government, for example, Pigouvian taxes to fix the price system, but that in many cases doesn't work. Then we could have regulation that could impose technology that requires even more knowledge of on the part of the regulator and uh, uh, is uh, fraught with even more problems. So um, uh, Augustin uh, slides had a, a few points about why on many cases uh, government performance uh, in, in, in this area is um, unsatisfactory. Now, then the question is, what if the political process does not work? Uh, then uh, the alternative is we have choices by socially conscientious executives uh, who are, or, uh, implement corporate social responsibility, consumers or investors. And this paper focuses on investors. And it does something that is really fascinating. It looks at a model where investors first demand a competitive return, but then some of them are sensitive to externalities, but the preferences are, are, are lexicographic. So really the first order uh, uh, criterion they apply is still, uh, they, they want to maximize returns. So, if there are sufficiently many of, many of them, then the first best uh, may actually even obtain. And this is where as a, as a reader, I step back and say, wow, uh, this is magic. Uh, so first we wanted to introduce the government in order to fix the market uh, because the market didn't work. Then we realized that the political process doesn't work. And now we are asking the market to fix itself. Or, so we are introducing uh, kind of a new type of, uh, of actor in, in the market uh, that not only improves things a little bit much of the time, but actually implements the first best. And so I want to know what the magic is. So as a, as a reader, I could stop here. As a discussant, I have to do my duties and ask, where does the rabbit go into the head? Kind of where's the magic in this paper? So let's go through this step by step. How does this actually work? So let me just rehearse the narrative of the argument. So uh, uh, Augustin gave a kind of very detailed uh, uh, discussion of the math and, uh, and, and how this works. So first part, uh, we have an economy with investors and entrepreneurs and they are also consumers and they're all atomistic. So nobody has any power, standard. Uh, then we have investors who choose funds. Some of them are socially responsible and some are not. Uh, that's good. Then we have funds to allocate capital to firms and firms that create externalities in production. That's going to probably standard wear in this kind of uh, paper. And then we have a socially responsible ESG fund that allocates capital only to firms that reduce emissions and demands a competitive return. So we do not even kind of 
introduce a trick here, like having some investors, for example, sacrifice some returns in order to have the, have the fund address some externalities. So it's really up to this point, everything is extremely standard. Or, and that's what I really love about this paper, because I think what the paper does is it develops a theory of ESG investing where almost all of the ingredients are so standard that, uh, that you cannot question them. So I just make a tick mark on them. But then we have our two, two assumptions where I think we need to dig into. The first one, I think, which, uh, which looks like a simplification, but I think it's not, is uh, that uh, we have only one ESG fund. Uh, so if there is any collective action problem to be solved here, at some point, I think uh, there, there is an issue that we have only one fund that now kind of serves as a coordinating device. The second thing is that entrepreneurs to reduce emissions to retain access to an ESG fund because there is a surge friction in the financial markets. So they can't they kind of costlessly substitute for capital. So we have a surge friction and therefore a friction in capital markets, which means that a single fund, even though the fund has investors that want to earn a competitive return, has actually some kind of discretionary power over these, uh, these entrepreneurs. So these are the issues I would like to, to talk about. So let me, let me comment. Our comment number one, our welfare is maximized if the single ESG fund allocates its capital optimally. So, um, let me go through the solution that, uh, that, uh, that August Sturm uh, presented mathematically. So if there is very little ESG capital, then it should invest in only one industry in order to maximize its impact. Um, if there is a little more ESG capital to go around, ESG capital is my shorthand for the number of investors who are basically uh, having, having these lexicographic preferences. Then um, the fund should invest in both industries and in this case, there is an optimality condition. So the fund uh, should then equate the marginal impact on welfare in each industry. So that's actually a pretty uh, complicated expression to solve. It's not mathematically super complicated, but conceptually what it has to think about is what is the impact on the entrepreneurs and what is the impact of the entrepreneurs on emissions and what uh, is the impact of the, this particular type of emissions in that industry on aggregate welfare. So, so solving this kind of marginal co optimality condition is actually very involved. So it requires that the ESG fund actually knows the marginal impact of capital on emissions in each industry and the marginal cost of emissions on, in each industry on welfare. So for me, the ESG fund solves a lot of issues in this economy. So it determines the achievable second best if social responsible capital is, is limited. So I think there's a lot of central planning. So there's a lot of planification here. So I put a picture of Jean Monnet, who was the head of the uh, 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 of central planning in France after World War II. So I think I think he would love your approach. He would love your paper. So, uh, so because your ESG fund is basically like a, uh, the Commissariat General that he was uh, heading uh, uh, in the 1940s. I have a lot of questions here. So uh, my, let me reveal my colors here. So uh, uh, I asked the question that I think is a real question that Milton, Milton Friedman asked in a famous article almost exactly 50 years ago. How can one, even the very sophisticated investor in this case, or so in, in he, he was addressing, of course, a slightly different agents, but I paraphrase him. How can one, even a very sophisticated investor, solve this problem if the government cannot? So, of course, we can provide a list of government failures, but all these government failures have a reason. So it's not like they are kind of, uh, kind of just evil people sitting in the government, and, uh, and that's why it kind of all falls apart. There are reasons why governments can't get their act together. And all these reasons all of a sudden kind of fall into the background and this magic fund can all of a sudden address a lot of these problems. So much more a Monet world than a Friedman world. That's where I'm skeptical. There's a second issue and that is coordination. There's only one ESG fund. I think I would like you to go through an extension where there are multiple ESG funds that compete for the capital of the socially sensitive investors. 
and for the return. And, and we still maintain that the, our investors have these lexicographic returns. So um, then welfare depends on the aggregate allocation. So this is, you haven't solved this, but this is, I think, what, what I think would come out. The welfare would still depend on the optimal aggregate allocation of capital across industry. Uh, that is, if social responsible capital is scarce, then all funds in this economy must coordinate to invest in the same industry with the same emission target. Alternatively, if you have a little more socially responsible capital go around, then the, uh, uh, this uh, socially responsible capital uh, should be invested in multiple, like in your case, two industry, but then they must kind of optimally solve this aggregate condition. So the funds must coordinate their investments so that uh, they agree with the aggregate optimality conditions. And I ask myself, how are these conditions going to be decentralized? So how are we thinking about an economy in which this central planning problem is solved if we have multiple decentralized uh, decision makers? I think, I think that's a problem that, that you need to address. Finally, I think we have enormously sophisticated investors here. So the optimal capital allocation depends on the impact of capital allocation. And if you ask me, this discussion, which I think, unfortunately, Augustin put very little emphasis on in the presentation, I think actually that's for me, is the core of the paper and the one that I thought uh, was, uh, was really stunning and something that I, I think I really took away from, from reading this paper. So there is corollary one, which I think should be upgraded to a proposition, which says that, just allocating capital towards cleaner industry actually has zero impact. I think actually that's a very important result because I think uh, that's also kind of back in, in, uh, in, 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 in in some of these questions, shouldn't kind of the conscientious investors, shouldn't they kind of allocate just uh, their capital to industries uh, that have a better carbon footprint? But even within industry, you have proposition four, which I would like to sharpen a little bit. It says, the ESG fund may have a higher footprint than a regular fund. That is, if you have a, a, a socially conscientious fund, it may still have a higher carbon footprint that is kind of worse or kind of uh, ecological parameters than a regular fund, because a footprint has nothing to do with impact. You want to allocate capital optimally in this fund, or you want the fund to allocate capital optimally to entrepreneurs to maximize impact. That is to get uh, the potentially extremely dirty producers to become moderately dirty, which can be much more beneficial than our, our going somewhere where it's where everybody where everything is already clean. So, so that means the ESG fund by the investor is really evaluated based on the counterfactual because it's a, it uh, is uh, based on the emissions with our socially sensitive capital allocations relative to emissions without such a capital allocation. So as an investor in such a fund, I must understand that, yeah, I'm investing in lots of dirty companies, but if I wouldn't be doing this, that the world would be so much worse. So I come to the, that is a consequence. Individual investors really have to be very sophisticated here. They have to understand that they should optimally invest in a fund that invests in dirty industry, like for example, power generation, where the fund pushes the, the providers towards, for example, efficient coal powered uh, power plants, which are kind of moderately dirty compared to the really badly dirty ones, say lignite, um, because they understand the counterfactual that the alternatives would be so much worse. So I think that's putting an extremely high bar on individual investors. There's another thing that I, I think kind of seconds. Sorry, we are, we, we are already out of time. So maybe 30 uh, seconds. Can you give minute. me one more minute? Um, sure. <laughs> until, okay. Um, so last question, what if some quest investors are Kantian rather than consequentialist? So for example, they simply have a principle for clean industries and technologies. So they don't understand trade-offs. They don't understand counterfactuals. Uh, so what would happen, for example, if the investors in your economy would use footprint, for example, as you define it, to allocate capital? So I think that would be an interesting thing to also look at and, and analyze. I'm going to skip this slide and go to my summary because I'm running out of paper. I think this is a great paper. My personal takeaways are a little bit different from the author's takeaways. So my takeaway is that effective ESG investing is probably not going to work. 
because what the paper shows is that the bar is too demanding, it's too high. Uh, the uh, conditions on funds and investors and what they need to understand are extreme. Complex conditions for the allocation of capital, achievable second best and the counterfactual. Coordination problems, they need to uh, subscribe to consequentialist ethics. So my recommendation is to change the how-to spin of the paper to kind of where is the bar for effective ESG investment? And uh, I think the answer to me is probably uh, much more skeptical and negative than, mm -hmm. than the authors may sound it. But I think this is a paper that really kind of allows us to analyze the issue and actually understand them. And that's why I think it's, it's still a fantastic paper. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ernst. Uh, Augusta, would you like to uh, comment and uh, maybe yeah, uh, take yeah. One so of thanks a lot. Uh, sure. Th thanks a lot, Ernst. So great uh, discussion. Uh, I mean, all your points are valid, and, and you are right that uh, it's important to emphasize that this doctrine of ESG, in a sense, requires a pretty big amount of coordination. So I agree, it's uh, sort of assumed that they all coordinate on common standards, this fund. So there could be many of them, but we assume basically that they manage to reach agreement uh, on what is their common uh, choice for the standards they apply. And also uh, it's, uh, it's not a decentralized approach. So it's true that it requires them to compute the thresholds uh, he had. Uh, so here we could discuss a bit what happens if they make mistakes in a sense on the e hat. I think uh, I understand your point uh, um, uh, and where you come from, and I am not at all uh, a believer in um, in central planning uh, in, in general. Uh, but I, I think that the failures of the governments are not due to um, difficulties for them to um, to compute the appropriate e hat, but more difficulties to uh, to impose them or to uh, uh, to to to, uh, to just uh, you know like uh, make people vote for them in a sense. Um, so I think that's um, yeah. I think in a sense whether ESG can bring value depends on what you believe are the main failures from uh, the government uh, actions. If it's just you know like traditional failures from planification, then it's true that ESG is not going to be a good substitute for. Uh, government planification, but if these are failures due to political short-termism um, slash uh, lack of coordination across countries, then uh, it might help. Uh, so in a sense, I think the idea is maybe some kind of multilateralism uh, at the investor level is, is easier to achieve because their interests are more aligned in a sense than it is at the, at the country level where cooperation has, has shown to be extremely uh, uh, difficult and, and very slow. But all your points are well taken and, and we will actually uh, take them into account uh, when we uh, rewrite the paper. So thanks a lot and um, please uh, send me the, the discussion and maybe actually let's uh, let's talk some more uh, about it. I think this was a very, uh, very neat uh, set of points that you made. So thank you. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you, Agustar. Uh, do we have a question from the from the floor, from the panelists or? Is there anyone who would like to? Martin has a. There are two question. questions on the QA. Right. Um, <clears throat> um, what I was wondering about is you know, there's this one of the things I find really interesting about your model, Augusta, is <clears throat> that um, the re there's in the end no return sacrifice for impact, you know, and that, of course, has been a controversial question. Some people, particularly mm. practitioners, say there's this win-win situation. You can do better by being in the then mm. you know, some empirical evidence, some theory, like my paper with Marcus says, you actually have to sacrifice if you want to have impact. And I find interesting that in your paper, it's possible kind of with the same return. And could you give some more intuition what kind of the key uh, driver is? Is it that in equilibrium, all firms will behave and become clean? You know, that's kind of all mm. or nothing, the impact, or what What would you say is kind of the key for, for this result? Because I think from a, you know, investor's perspective, it's quite important to think about that question of the return. No, totally, totally. So I think you got it. There is a little bit of a diamond paradox um, effect, right? So you, you announce ex ante the standards, and basically all the companies uh, that can uh, are going to, uh, to comply uh, with them. Uh, it doesn't have to be, so it is in the model I have shown, it's a symmetric equilibrium and it's a bit in that sense a bit, uh, I mean, it's very homogeneous. They all comply, 
But actually, um, and that's something maybe we should do in robustness, you can have heterogeneity on the cost of compliance and you will have a mass of companies that choose not to comply just because it's too costly for them uh, to comply. It complexifies the, actually the computation of the optimal uh, threshold that, uh, that's, um, that's feasible. Uh, but the intuition is really that the search frictions introduce this sort of um, uh, reluctance to give up on access to uh, responsible capital. And I think when I think about, the, you know, is it plausible economically? Uh, I mean, what I see is that all the big companies, you know, in the S&P 500, in the DAX, in the CAC 40, they all take this pretty seriously, right? They have all started to apply to themselves standards that are above regulations, most of them. And so it has to be that these uh, uh, investors uh, are able to, uh, in a sense, impose, you know, like some norms that are a bit above uh, regulatory thresholds. And so I think there are two interpretations. So even the one you, you propose, which is that companies want to preserve current or future access to this pool of capital, or that they have very strong um, expectations on uh, regulations becoming tighter or maybe a third one, which is that employees and customers might also be uh, imposing their own uh, preferences to, uh, to companies. But I think it has to be a, a mix of these, these uh, three things. But uh, you are right, I mean, uh, just uh, to, to answer your question, so the, your, uh, your point was right. uh, exact, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I suggest we take a five minute break uh, and then start at 20 minutes to uh, four in five minutes with the next paper. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.